All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, so uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, this presentation is being recorded um, and it will be posted on the library's YouTube channel um, probably in a couple of days. So if you'd like to refer back to it later, you'll be able to do that. Um, I also wanted to let everyone know that the library's uh, seed library is going on right now. Um, that runs through April 30th. And um, you can submit requests for seeds online this year. Um, so if you go to the library's website and um, go to resources and then click on seed library, um, it will take you to the form for requesting seeds. Um, so with that, I'm really excited to um, introduce Courtney Masterson. Um, Courtney is um, an ecologist um, and the founder of Native Lands LLC. Um, she's also just a delightful human being um, and her enthusiasm for our natural world and uh, native plants in particular is um, just infectious. So I'm delighted to turn it over to Courtney. Thank you so much, Melissa. So grateful to be working with the library again and with you. Um, and I, I hope that there's a lot of people out there listening and please know that um, we welcome your questions and Melissa will help me field those um, throughout the, the talk, but I'll probably address most of them at the end. So don't, so hang on with us and um, I'll try to make sure we have time to chat at the end. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm gonna hit share screen. You'd think I'd be a pro at this by now, a year into a pandemic. <laughs> okay, so today we are here to chat about how to provide for bees in your garden spaces. And that can apply to any scale. Of course, your backyard, your business gardens, um, your uh, acreage, if you own land, you're lucky enough to own land. Um, however, uh, I will be specifically referring to native bees in this talk. Um, though it does still apply to honeybees if you happen to be um, a honeybee caregiver. <laughs> um, and please put your questions about that um, in the chat as well. I can still chat about uh, honeybees. So I work with several different nonprofit and educational organizations in the Lawrence and Kansas City and Topeka communities. Um, the, here's the logos for some of those and you'll notice um, Grassland Heritage Foundation and Friends of the Ka among them. I'm currently working on community restoration projects with both of them um, right here in the uh, Lawrence uh, Douglas County area. So definitely check out our Facebook page if you'd like to get involved in our community work. But I also spend an awful lot of my time working with uh, private landowners and um, businesses on providing native plant resources for uh, purposes such as providing for pollinators and wildlife, among many other things. And we'll talk about that throughout the, throughout the slides. <laughs> and so an ecologist, if you don't know, is, um, is a scientist who studies organisms and their interactions in their environment. So my specialty is studying the way animals interact with native plants. And so I've spent <clears throat> um, about a decade in observation of these relationships, um, and I did a lot of my research at KU, and hence my fondness for the Lawrence community. And I did do a lot of my research and studies in Kansas City as well. So um, I call both places home, and I'm grateful for communities in both spaces. Um, my office is the natural landscapes of Kansas and Missouri, mostly Kansas. Um, a lot of our native plants are going to be found on both sides of the state line. They don't, um, they don't understand state lines the way that we do. <laughs> so um, my skill set transfers really easily from one community, human community to another. Um, and thankfully, botanical skills uh, transfer to most ecosystems <laughs> um, if you take the time to learn the plants um, names and, and how they interact with each other. Kansas is home to a huge uh, diversity of plants. Uh, over 2,000 species of plants are native to our state. And I include these two pictures. Um, on the left, uh, far west central Kansas. Um, there on the right, that's more of what our Flint Hills community looks like. Um, and northeastern Kansas, even wetter, 
would be taller vegetation, a lot of the same species, but um, plants that have adapted to our rainfall. That's a little higher than what you're gonna see in that almost desertous community there on the left. To simplify the ecosystems of Kansas, and the reason I bring this up is because as gardeners, we have to think of what the ecosystem of our yard is. Um, I know that's a different way of thinking about gardening, but when you think about native plants, you have to know um, what's appropriate for your space. So to put it really simply, we have four <clears throat> broad ecosystem types in Kansas. We have prairies or grasslands of several types. We have deciduous forest. Um, we have the ecotone or the marriage of forest and prairie. And then we have wetland spaces or wet prairie spaces. Um, and we can pull from those ecosystems to inform the plants we use in our gardens. And the most important reason we do uh, native landscaping, the reason we include native plants in our yards is because we are rapidly losing our ecosystems native to the state. Um, as humans, it's important for us to have a place to live, um, but we are regularly altering the way that we develop spaces to ensure um, that we can provide for native landscapes. And you can, while these are modern pictures, <laughs> um, you can sort of feel the difference, right, between an expansive grassland space with forests around waterways versus um, impervious surfaces and, you know, uh, concrete and uh, um, metal structures that may not host plant life, let alone the animals that depend on them. So I try to find a way to incorporate native plant spaces into urban areas as part of what I do as well. So we're based out of Lawrence, um, so I use this KU uh, campus example a lot, but if you're, you're uh, watching from a different uh, space in the Midwest, um, the story is going to be similar for you as well. Um, Lawrence campus, when European settlers first arrived, would have been, for the vast majority of it, would have been prairie, tall grass prairie. Um, and if you're in Lawrence, you sense that we've got hills and valleys. <laughs> so the hills would have been prairie landscapes and then the valleys would have had water, uh, waterways running through them like the expansive Kansas River um, and the Wakarusa River, but several creeks um, and streams that um, would have been buffered by forested areas and wetlands. So that's where you would have found those other ecosystems um, outside of prairie. Uh, the Kansas Biological Survey did a lot of really great research on where prairie and forest would have been historically in Douglas County. Uh, and there's some really great maps generated by that research. And this is one I like to share, which shows on, uh, the uh, last remaining prairies and forests that would have been here historically. So they're kind of hard to see, which is just um, uh, further demonstrates how little native landscape is left in our county and you can you can take this concept and apply it to the larger midwest landscape because this is the story for most counties um, in our state and um, across the tall grass prairie region um, and as we lose these plants we or these ecosystems we lose the foundation for the wildlife that depend on them and that's where my passion comes from um, for prairie is, um, like I said, how do animals interact with our native plants? What exactly are they dependent on? What are the specific relationships? Are there organisms that are more generalist, can use more plants um, versus uh, uh, insects that are dependent on specific species? Um, these are all fascinating topics to me and they give me the insight to help people build little micro ecosystems in their backyards or um, larger garden spaces or across landscapes. The um, ecosystems that we're losing to development are um, vital resources for pollinators. And we owe pollinators a lot. Um, not only are they beautiful and um, uh, you know wonderful to watch and they bring me joy spending time with them, but they also provide us uh, a, a great deal of resources when it comes to our diet 
and um, the sustainability of our ecosystems that protect our soil and our water quality. Um, without pollinators, we wouldn't have <laughs> all the delicious um, fruits and vegetables that are pollinated plants. Um, the big difference if you're not a food systems person between the left and the right photo are, is the loss of plants that depend on pollination, right? Um, and the reason you still see grains um, and meat products is that um, grains tend to be wind pollinated. Meat products, I think this is a little bit of a misnomer between the two pictures. Um, when we think about chickens and cows and pigs, those animals are dependent on plant systems as well. So I think it's a little bit, it's not as black and white as these pictures make it seem. <laughs> if we were to lose our prairies, we would have a really hard time producing meat in Kansas as well, uh, beef specifically. Um, so it could be an even more bleak relationship than this is depicting. So to provide for them, because they give so much to us, we have to think of what are the basics that we need to provide for pollinators. So at the very um, lowest level, we need to provide food, shelter, and water, just like we would provide for um, any person, right? Any human being, the basic necessities are these things. Um, and when we think about food for pollinators, look at this adorable bee, long-horned bee. <laughs> uh, thank you to Nature Conservancy for sharing this image with us, Chris Helzer specifically. Check out his work, very great photographer and educator. Um, food for a bee and many pollinators um, is nectar and pollen. So nectar is sweet. Um, it's the uh, material that a plant will produce to attract a pollinator. Um, and the pollen is the protein for the pollinator. So um, they're there picking up something sweet to drink, but they're also picking up that pollen to provide protein in their diet um, and to feed their young. Um, we don't think of nectar and pollen when we're planting very often, but that's sort of one of the transitional thought processes for native gardening uh, versus um, our more traditional gardening. And we can provide for pollinators with um, many of the things that we're doing in the garden already, including um, a lot of the food crops that we're growing. So um, squash plants, uh, anything in the squash family, anything in the nightshade family, like your tomatoes or potatoes, um, peppers, those are pollinated by native bees, not honeybees. So uh, for instance, the nightshades will only drop their pollen if they receive vibrations from a native bee like a bumblebee. Um, honeybees aren't capable of vibrating in that way. So um, while we don't think about our native bees as being um, vital to our food resources, um, we, would, we would be completely without some of our favorite foods if they, did, if they didn't exist. And I like this quote from pollinator.org. I won't read it to you because you've likely read it already <laughs> and it will be in the YouTube video uh, to catch later. But um, the vast majority of our pollinators are insects. While it's really very magical to think about hummingbirds and bats and other small mammals um, as pollinators and they're vital pollinators. Um, most of the things that are, think, most of the organisms that are uh, pollinating our, our crops and our native plants uh, belong to the, the insect. Um, uh, category. So what we need to do is think about the plant resources we're providing and how they relate to the insect world. And I've done a little bit of work here to break uh, examples out by season, but by no means are these um, all inclusive, right? So if there's 2000 plants that are native to Kansas, there's an awful lot more than what I'm presenting here. So definitely if you have questions, um, drop them into the chat box and I'll, I'll help answer those later. So uh, like I said, think about the relationship of the insects. Um, I have a lot of butterfly examples here because um, I've done a, some work there, but uh, bees have similar relationships. So this requires a little bit of research. Um, if you're providing for a specific insect like the painted lady, then you would want to provide its host plant as well as nectar resources for that butterfly. So the young caterpillars of the American Painted Lady eat uh, members of the pussy toe family, which is what you see on the right there. Um, and the adult uh, butterflies can nectar on 
a lot of different things. Um, so having native plant nectar resources is important too, to uh, support the whole life cycle of the butterfly or the bee or the moth. Um, oh, and on the left there is our red buds. They're blooming right now. Melissa and I were chatting about that um, when I got on the call a little bit early. Look out your window for pink flowers and check out the red buds. They're a really important uh, early nectar and pollen resource for bees. Um, and you can eat the flowers, but let the bees use them <laughs> and, uh, and then you can have some. So in the summer, you might see plants like milkweeds, wild indigos, and a lot of us here in Lawrence know the story of the monarch life cycle and how they are dependent on milkweeds um, to reproduce. Um, their young can only eat milkweed, but you may not think about that relationship between other insects and other native plants. Um, so this gorgeous dusky wing um, is dependent on wild indigo for its young to eat. Um, and what a gorgeous plant. Both of these are perennial plant species, so they'll come back every year um, and grow larger and uh, bloom more for uh, the butterflies and their young. And in the fall, you see that transition in prairies to the yellows, uh, the purples uh, of Kansas prairie fall uh, color suite. And here's a couple of other examples. On the left, that's um, Helianthus mollis or ashy sunflower, which is a host plant for the silvery checker spot butterfly. And then on the right is one of the um, tick tree foils um, or the sticky fruits that you find on your, um, your pants when you walk through uh, prairie areas. And look at that gorgeous dusky wing. Oh, that's a carryover. <laughs> uh, but the dusky wing is also um, fond of eating this legume, which makes sense because the um, indigo and the uh, tick tree foil are both legumes. So you could imagine um, multiple insects would, would eat legumes. They're delicious and high in protein. So we're gonna talk a lot about plants the second half of this talk, but I wanted to share some information on providing shelter for native bees. So 70% approximately of our native bees live in the soil um, and are in danger of um, being lost if you turn your soil every time you manage your garden. So um, soil preservation is a really important conservation uh, technique for native bees. But the other 25-ish percent live in the stems of plants in your garden over the winter. Um, so leaving those stems standing uh, throughout the winter and not cleaning up until about now. I'm not going to clean up for another week or two um, until you start to see bees out and about. Um, leaving these stems standing as nurseries for those bees is really important. Um, here's some nice images of bees and other pollinators using um, plant resources over the winter and in, in coming out of the soil. Um, so leaving your leaves, leaving your branches is a really important native gardening technique um, for uh, bee and pollinator conservation. And you also would want to reduce or completely stop using um, chemicals. And that's really easy to do in a native garden. Um, we can talk more about that in our discussion later, but any um, chemicals that you're introducing to your native garden space put, are, um, are a potential hazard to native bees and other insects that use that space, not to mention um, the rest of the ecosystem that are interacting with those insects and plants. So it'll still be harmful to birds, um, you know, frogs, anything that's going to consume the animals that are using your native plants as well. <clears throat> and finally, for basic necessities, let's provide water for our native bees and pollinators. I do this by providing puddling areas and that can look like um, a craggy rock in your garden or a shallow dish with stones in it and or rocks in it so they don't drown. It's difficult for a bee to dip into a six inch puddle um, without falling in. So provide them somewhere to perch and drink. Um, here's another couple of examples. I kind of like the um, water bowl there that you use for cats and dogs. That way there's always water um, 
coming into the puddling site. Um, and what a cool idea to get moss in your puddle. I never had luck moving moss around, but maybe some of you are more gifted than me. And remember that you're either dumping this water out um, daily or every couple of days at least, or it's a flowing water source so that you're not providing habitat for mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are, do not need our help. <laughs> um, they're doing quite well on their own and they're an important food source for other um, animals in our ecosystem, but you don't need to have them all around your house. Um, so <clears throat> now we're gonna focus more on how we choose the plants for our garden. Um, this is just like any other skill that you would learn. I'm gonna provide you some introductory information. Um, we are very lucky to have a, a, a great amount of native gardening education online. And I will share some of the resources with you towards the end of my talk. Um, but please feel free to ask questions and ask the people around you who are experimenting with native plants. Um, use your network. Um, and once you get comfortable with native gardening, recognize that your garden provides uh, an important resource for um, citizen science work. So, and that means you as a citizen um, or your friends and neighbors um, observing your plants and sharing that information with the um, organizations around you that are collecting data on how animals use native plants. There's some really great projects out there um, observing monarchs, observing specific bumblebees that are in danger. Um, and, and a lot of it's more general, you know, who's using the plants, when are they using the plants, how often are they using the plants. Um, and that's something that we um, are already sort of recording in our heads, you know. Um, I love to tell stories about um, the new butterflies I see on my plants each year. Um, so yesterday I shared on my Facebook page that we saw our first um, hummingbird moth um, which is a moth that looks a little bit like a hummingbird um, yesterday out in the field. And um, we do that naturally as humans, we're storytellers. Citizen science just um, helps us turn those stories into numbers so that we can um, provide protections for these important animals and plants. So anytime I'm approaching a garden space, I think, um, in two, from two different parts of my brain. <laughs> think of the ecology of the site, but also think about what is it going to look like? I think it's important that we enjoy the look of our gardens um, and that we are able to um, um, suit our gardening style uh, with native plants. So first, um, as an ecologist, the first thing I think about is what plants can I get for this space, <laughs> um, which is going to be your largest scope. Um, there are an awful lot of native plant species available commercially. You may have to shop around to find everything that you want, um, but we are lucky to see that field growing um, and the demand for native plants is growing. So there's new businesses all the time um, providing native plants and native plant services. Um, so check in with your local nurseries and uh, landscapers and, and ask them what their rates are. Um, I do consider native plantings the most affordable gardening that you can do because the vast majority of it is going to be perennial gardening. So what you're planting now um, will come back every year, uh, making your job easier, but also reducing the expense of plants for your garden every year. And then I will start to think about um, what are the environmental factors of the site? So um, how tall does this planting need to be or what's the desire of my gardener? Um, how much space do we have to fill? What's the sun like? What's the soil texture like? What's the moisture like? Um, how can we provide bloom, blooming resources throughout the entire year um, with the exception of winter? Um, are there any organisms that the gardener is interested in hosting? Do they want a butterfly garden, a bird garden, a monarch garden, a swallowtail garden? Um, all of those are going to have a different suite of plants um, used in them. So we have to think from the, our scientific scope. And again, I have a huge palette of plants to choose from. Um, so I'm by no means limited um, with what I, with, with my palate, but I am going to be limited by those ecological factors. So 
no matter what I do, I'm not going to be able to plant a um, butterfly milkweed, the orange flower down there in the middle, um, in a full shade space. It just wouldn't be successful, um, no matter how much I want one. <laughs> so um, thinking about those ecological factors first is going to help you determine which suite, which ecosystem you're planting. And then decide, like I said, who are you planting for? Um, if the goal is stormwater management, you're going to go with perhaps more wet prairie or wetland species um, and deep rooted native grasses. Um, if you're looking for um, to provide for a particular organism like a specific bird or bees or butterflies, then you'd wanna do some research on what their host plants are. And don't forget that native plants um, have been an important food and medicine resource for the people of the prairie for thousands of years. Um, and that's something that we should recognize value and practice um, if we feel comfortable with that. So experimenting with native plants as resources for our own culture and um, daily practice is really important too. So again, if you're planting for pollinators, think about those bare necessities and um, start and it's alter the way that you manage your garden. So thinking about how can you provide some bare soil for the bees that nest in the ground to access those spaces? Um, what, stem, what plants could you plant that provide hollow stems for bees? Um, do you have to clean up the leaves or that, that tree limb that uh, fell into the garden or is it something that you could leave there for a while for wildlife to use? Um, just shifting the way that you think and then using plants as host plants and as nectar plants um, for pollinators are the sort of the key concepts there. But when you shift over to thinking about planting for birds, you're still gonna plant host plants, um, but in sort of a, a sick but amazing twist, you're planting those host plants for the birds to eat the caterpillars off of them, <laughs> um, which is really great. Uh, I really, it's hard to fall in love with a monarch caterpillar and spend a bunch of time with it and then it just disappears. It's possible that it's reached that point in its life cycle where it's going to build a chrysalis and metamorphose into a beautiful butterfly, but it's also possible that um, this bird has come down to snack on uh, monarch butterflies. It's really interesting to think about how caterpillars defend themselves against bird, bird um, hunting, but uh, like this great quote from Doug Tallamy says, I mean, chickadees are a, a researched example, but I imagine that this, this big number can be applied to an awful lot of our native bird species. So um, looking, birds are looking for caterpillars and worms and insects constantly um, to feed their young, especially in the spring and summer seasons. So providing host plants for those insects to eat is the best thing you can do for birds. And then also providing uh, seeds that produce seed or seeds, plants that produce seeds um, like echinacea seen there in the bottom picture. Um, and a lot of the aster species, a lot of um, the thicker, nuttier species um, like the legumes are going to produce seeds for birds. And then again, that shelter you're leaving for the bees to overwinter and also provides shelter for birds, especially if it's low to the ground. Um, so that they can get out of the um, intense weather in the winter. So um, thinking about, like I said, the sunlight, the soil texture, the moisture in maximizing diversity um, will be sort of your first step. And there's a Kansas ecosystem or a Missouri ecosystem if you're coming from Kansas City area. Um, there's an ecosystem for each uh, situation you're gonna find in your garden. Um, if you have a part shade space, think of that as um, the edge of the forest, right? Um, the north side of my house, for instance, I might plant uh, forest edge and some deeper forest species. But in my front yard, um, where I don't have any tree cover, I would be looking at more of a prairie palette um, and everything in between. Um, so start thinking about Kansas and Missouri ecosystems and how you would apply those to your garden spaces. And I really like to get out into a wild space and observe the plants that live there naturally 
um, and think about using those in my garden and would they be an appropriate uh, plant for my space. Uh, I really like to recommend to my clients that they reach out to their local extension office um, to get soil testing done. Um, they can't help you a ton with site conditions if you've taken the soil away from your yard um, or your wherever your garden is, um, but they can tell you the composition of the soil, you know, um, what's the texture, is it clay, silt, sand, um, and that texture can tell you a lot about what the water at the site is going to be like, but only you, the landowner, the land manager, <laughs> can really describe how much water you're seeing in that site. Um, so observe your garden, how much water is there? How long does the soil stay moist? Um, is there pooling of water? Um, is there a lot of rock? Um, properties like that are going to inform which plants you would choose um, again. Um, and so a little bit of research is worthwhile um, to increase the likelihood of success. And then, I try to get people to think about whether the plants that they love in our native ecosystems are the right plant for their space. Um, for instance, in these two pictures on the left there, that's probably um, one of our native goldenrods, Canada goldenrod perhaps, um, that they're just very large and very aggressive for a garden space. And while they provide amazing resources for pollinators in the fall, um, they may be too unwieldy for your garden space unless you have a nice large naturalized area. And on the right there, that's prairie dock to the right of that group of people. And that is not an exaggeration. That's how big they get. Um, and they do tend to fall over if they don't have a lot of tall grass friends around. Um, and, but they're a really cool specimen plant, um, a cool conversation plant for your garden. But is that the right choice um, for a small garden in your front yard? that'll be up to you. And they are kind of aggressive seed droppers, but really good seed plant for birds. So once you think about what, what height, how much space you have, you're going to make a wish list of plants. And I recommend reaching out to um, a professional or your native plant society or um, your, your native planting group um, on social media and ask people's opinions. Um, a lot of people have experimented, for instance, with the plant on the right there, Golden Alexander. It's one of my favorite native plants. Um, if you squint, you can see the swallowtails using it in the center picture. It's an important swallowtail host plant, but it's not the right plant for every situation. It's an aggressive spreader um, and it only blooms for a short period of time. So I wanna make sure that my garden can host lots of species of native plants, not just one. <laughs> so uh, the height is right, but the, the aggression level um, which is kind of a mean word to use, but it's a little pushy. It doesn't share well, um, but it's easy to weed out. So if you think you could spend a lot of time in your garden, it might be the right choice for you if you really love swallowtail, um, caterpillars and butterflies. Um, I get this question about cultivars a lot. I'm gonna be quick here so that we have time for questions, but I, my hard fast rule is unless you absolutely must use a cultivar because you're in love with it or it was grandma's plant or mom's plant or dad's plant and you have a special relationship with it um, it is always the right choice to use the native species um, when it comes to a cultivar unless that's that particular cultivar has been researched and found to provide similar resources to wildlife as its native counterpart i wouldn't use it it's too complicated to know for sure if wildlife are using it the same way that they would the native type. Um, and while they're pretty to us, there's no reason uh, ecologically to use a cultivar. Um, and often it uh, makes it more difficult for pollinators to find and utilize um, the flowers. So I recommend against them unless there's a, a, a reason um, that, that you wanna have them and then you can use them to your heart's desire. <laughs> um, just know that often they will um, hybridize or breed with your native types. So for instance, if you're planting multiple cultivars of echinacea, many of them will breed with each other and you will lose um, your native type if they're inter, uh, interplanted. So ask for help again, um, if you're not sure. 
if, it, if using a cultivar is the right step. And then you get to, the, to do the fun part of um, thinking like an artist about your space. I have some nice pictures here of native plants being used um, in, you know, for their form and function, but also just um, for the stunning effect of using native plants. Um, so on the left there is more of a zero scaping type of garden utilizing a lot of native plants. So short grasses uh, that are drought tolerant, um, more um, spurge and uh, uh, drought tolerant forbs like that, um, sages. Um, and on the right there is the flip of that, really wet spaces and using wetland plants like uh, the two lobelias there, that's uh, cardinal flower and blue lobelia um, used uh, usually as hummingbird host plants in plantings, um, but they just love wet spaces. So a really cool artistic way to use that wet space in your yard without uh, modifying the soil. So just put a boardwalk in and, <laughs> and embrace the wetness. Um, if you get on Wikipedia, there are over 120 types of gardening styles. Um, and here's a few of the styles that I pulled from their examples. But um, if you find yourself drawn to a particular style, don't feel disappointed that um, you'd rather do native plants and let go of the gardening style that you are uh, drawn to because you can actually stick a native plant into these styles pretty easily. So for example, that bottom left style, that Japanese garden style, um, I pulled some native plants that could be used in this space rather than um, inviting uh, species from other parts of the world into your yard. Um, you could use plants that are native to Kansas and Missouri in that same style. So for instance, the pinks of the red buds could be used um, for the pinks in this garden and the, the short lawn could be sedges and short woodland um, ephemerals like uh, wood sorrel. And the yellows can be um, found in a lot of our small shrubs, but the leatherwood is such a gorgeous um, plant and would be a great chartreuse for um, this style. So don't, um, don't feel limited by native plants. So the styles like Japanese gardening and the other styles are a lot more about maintenance than they are about which species are included. So I hear some lovely palettes for each season that I uh, included to share with you, things that I love. Um, the trout lilies on the bottom left are blooming right now, the red buds in the center. The top left there is prairie smoke. It's native to the northern part of the Tallgrass Prairie region. Um, I do see bees visit it in my garden, um, but it isn't native to Kansas. Um, you can draw that line of where, where you want to draw the line for what's native and what's not for your garden on your own. It's up to you. <laughs> um, and so here is rose verbena, uh, foxglove, beard tongue, wild, uh, or sorry, Missouri um, evening primrose and wild blue indigo. Um, I bet you recognize a lot of these plants, some of the sunflower uh, species um, and the sylphium species, which include our compass plants and rosin weeds. Echinacea. Um, on the bottom left there, clammy weed glowing in the sun is one of my favorite native plants, short lived, but produces a lot of seeds. And it looks a lot like Rocky Mountain bee plant or bee plants that Cleome that a lot of people love for their gardens. There's a native for that. <laughs> um, and then my favorite milkweed on the bottom right, purple milkweed, in my opinion, the most beautiful and most versatile milkweed, but also the hardest to find commercially. And then, like I said, in fall, you're transitioning to the golds, the blues, the purples uh, of the prairie if you're in full sun. Um, and so you can capture that palette. And maybe the most overlooked season for native gardening is the one that's the most important for wildlife, um, the winter season. So what's gonna look interesting? What are the textures? What are the colors you wanna see in your winter garden? Because you're um, going to be with them for a while, <laughs> right? So if I haven't cut down my garden until the end of April. So from about um, you know October, November until the end of April, I'm looking at my winter garden. So what do I want to see? And there's some, some landscapers, um, some landscape architects that have 
um, really focused on winter interest in their gardens. So this one is particularly beautiful. Um, and Pete Udolph's work is, focuses a lot on uh, texture and, and winter interest. So definitely think about what you're leaving standing and what you wanna look at. Um, here are some of the resources I would recommend for garden design. Um, they're hard to see maybe, but Missouri Department of Conservation has a great free resource called Native Plants for Your Landscapes, just a handout. And then you could get on to um, Jayhawk Audubon or just the Audubon website and look at their Plants for Birds program. There's some really great books, including this one from Alan Branhagen that I really like um, that sorts plants by ecosystem. And then look at some of the native plant uh, vendors like Prairie Moon Nursery um, for their example garden designs. And my challenge to you is even if you've tried native plants before, pick one new native plant for your garden this year, at least, <laughs> and um, buy that native plant locally. There's a lot of really great native plant sales um, throughout Kansas City and Lawrence. Um, so do a little bit of homework before you leave home. You won't end up feeling forced to buy cultivars or plants with, um, that have been treated for insects or any of the other faux pas of native gardening if you leave the house with a specific goal. Um, and if you visit one of these sales, you're not going to have any issues finding native plants. So on the top left there, Deep Roots is most, or the sale that's coming up next is the one on April 10th in Prairie Village. Grass and Heritage Foundation's native plant sale is May 15th. And Monarch Watch is doing a multi-day pickup for their native plant sale and you do your ordering online. So check out those organizations and uh, sign up for their native plant sales. And then here's a nice list of groups that can provide you additional resources for native gardening. Um, I've worked with all of these folks. Um, and like Melissa said, you can still get seeds uh, in the seed library through the Lawrence Public Library. So if you just don't have it in your budget to try native plants this year, try some seeds um, and reach out if you need help getting those germinated. It's tough when you're starting this late in the year. Um, and lean on your master gardeners. There's a couple of great demonstration sites that they uh, manage at Monarch Watch and the Native Medicinal Plant Garden north of Lawrence where you can see native plants in action. Um, and Grassland Heritage Foundation has a bunch of native plant education or gardening education events coming up. So check that out too. I like to end my talks with where are the monarchs right now? Um, this was pulled today off of the Journey North website. You should definitely check out Journey North. They track monarchs and hummingbirds and all sorts of other organisms with citizen science data. So these are people like you reporting when they see monarchs. So this is data on when the adult monarchs have been cited. So they are in Southern Kansas as of now. So do you have milkweed in your garden? And if you don't, <laughs> what are you gonna do about it? Thank you so, so much for joining me today. Um, please uh, ask me questions and share your stories and let me know how I can help you. you've got questions for Courtney, go ahead and drop those in the chat or you can use the Q&A as well. Courtney, I wondered, um, I know that there are some um, ecosystem restoration projects that have been going on. Um, are there any happening or that will be happening that um, folks can get involved in if they're interested in that? Yes, and thank you for asking. Um, there are so many really great projects happening, especially if you're up in Kansas City, there's some other organizations working up there. Um, here in the Lawrence area, um, I'm collaborating with a couple of different entities on different spaces. So we are working with Friends of the Caw to uh, plant and restore uh, prairie and riparian forest at the Eudora boat ramp. So if you live near Eudora and you want to join us for activities there, definitely check out the Friends of the Caw social media pages where they share events and the Native Lands page as well. Um, and we're working with Grassland Heritage Foundation to plant and restore prairie at Blackjack Battlefield in Baldwin City um, here in Douglas County. So if you haven't been out there, super cool site, um, really great remnant prairie um, there and across the street at Ivan Boyd Prairie. Um, 
and we're always doing new restoration projects. Um, we have a lot of really cool work going on in local parks um, and on private land. If you're interested in getting involved, definitely reach out to us and we'll share um, more resources. And if you're in Kansas City, check out the work of um, Heartland Conservation Alliance and um, Kansas City Wildlands. Both of those nonprofits regularly hold conservation work days with their community. And I highly recommend collaborating with them. Thank you, Melissa. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's just a great way to get some hands-on experience with yeah. some experts by your side if you're just kind of getting your feet wet. Definitely. I think that um, the best way to learn about native gardening is to get out into those ecosystems and observe the plants. Um, not all of them are available commercially, but an awful lot of them are. Um, and observing them in their ecosystem is the best way to get to know them. So I agree with you. Um, I guess another question that I had, um, do you have any suggestions for um, sort of lawn alternatives for you know folks who are looking to um, have a more um, pollinator friendly yard um, overall? Well, yeah, and that's a good question. And um, please, if you have a specific situation, feel free to reach out, but I'm going to speak generally. If you have um, a lot of sunshine available to you, then you're going to be able to utilize a lot of the short prairie um, plants, including um, short grasses uh, like blue grandma grass. Um, buffalo grass is something that I get asked a lot about. If you live further to the west, then you might be able to utilize buffalo grass. It doesn't love Northeast Kansas. It's not native to Douglas County. Um, it's too wet here. So the our um, our close relative is Blue Grandma. It's only a little bit taller. It's in the same genus as buffalo grass and has much the same feel. But then I would challenge you to add short wildflowers to that space as well, um, because it's difficult. These plants don't like to live all on their own. They they are part of an ecosystem. So you'd have a really hard time with a, a monoculture of blue, blue grandma, even if it does like it here, um, add some wildflowers for the bees and also to make, make your life easier. And then for shade, um, again, you could use the short wildflowers that are native to the forest, but you're gonna have to dip into a different um, suite of species when it comes to a grassy element. And I use native sedges, um, which some people think of sedge as a dirty word because we spend so much time um, treating them in our lawns. And those sedges that you're treating in your lawns are usually non-native plants that have been introduced um, to Kansas. Um, the sedges that are native here are beautiful, often slender species. They look a lot like grass. They just don't get much taller than five or six inches, um, which is exactly what we want. Um, but we just, they're so unfamiliar to us. You can't seed them, unfortunately, like you would a lawn. So you can't, I can't just come in and, and throw some seed on the ground and you get a sedge lawn. Um, usually those are installed with plugs and it does cost more, but it's a forever lawn, which is really nice. Um, and I'd love to help anybody. I work with East Lawrence people a lot, have no sunshine. <laughs> so this is a known problem and um, I'm happy to point you in the right direction. I, one other question that I had, um, so you talked a little bit about, you know, ways to support pollinators without encouraging mosquitoes. Do you have any, um, any other suggestions for how to control mosquitoes in a way that isn't detrimental to our pollinator friends? Good question. Um, so there's a couple of different perspectives to take. One of them is prevention, right? Just no standing water. Sometimes that's difficult. Um, if you have a neighbor who doesn't really have an interest in <laughs> flipping their buckets over for you. Um, I had a neighbor once who had a canoe in their yard um, that was always full of water <laughs> and there was nothing I could do about it. Um, in that situation, then you're looking at how do I combat this problem? So first, no standing water. If you have uh, rain barrels, make sure they're covered with screen, tight screen, not anything that a mosquito could squeeze through. And if you're concerned there's mosquitoes in those sources of water, dump them and start over again. Um, but if you are stuck with standing water, um, I would incorporate elements to your garden that encourage the animals that eat mosquitoes to visit. So um, sometimes that looks like um, a water feature because um, the best predators, in my opinion, of mosquitoes are dragonflies and they're gonna look for moving water. Um, 
a lot of people think about bats as combating um, mosquito populations. There's, I've talked to different bat experts and some say that they don't really eat mosquitoes and some say that they really do. <laughs> it's not gonna hurt you to encourage bats to use your yard. Um, so putting up bat houses, if you have a space to do that is a good idea. And just encouraging birds, bird gardens, birds, little birds eat mosquitoes. So anything you can do to bring the mosquitoes natural predators to your yard is a is a good thing for your ecosystem. Well, um, it looks like that might be all of our questions for today. Um, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Um, it's always such a pleasure to um, to hear you. Um, I guess I just want to remind folks that this um, will be posted on the library's um, YouTube channel. Um, and uh, don't, yeah, don't forget about our seed library. Um, we do have some native seed varieties um, available through that that um, Courtney actually um, provided for us. So um, thank you everyone for making time to um, hang out with us today and um, enjoy your afternoon. Thanks everyone, I appreciate you. And thanks Melissa very much. <laughs>